Hi, I'm Sandy Sturgeon, along with my wife, Brooke West. We are the owners of Frontline Engraving here in Lava Hot Springs, Idaho. We specialize in hand engraving on firearms, knives, motorcycle components, and jewelry. We also make touch marks or maker's marks for knife makers, blacksmiths, and leather workers. We've been getting a lot of requests as to how we go about making these punches. So we decided to do this little video. It'll be a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial, so to speak, on how we go about making these. And hope you learned something from it. And I hope you enjoy it. Once an order is placed and the client's artwork is agreed upon, I bring it digitally into my AutoCAD program. This is a program I've been using for decades. I'm very familiar with it. It's an easy program for me to use for drawing modifications, etc. The other thing I like about this program is I can precisely scale the artwork to the requested size that's being wanted on the punch. If there's any problems at this time, I can identify them very, very, very easily and we might have to change the size of the punch a little bit or we might have to modify the artwork a little bit to get the crisp clear image that the client is looking for. I chose this particular layout for this video. It has a couple of elements that uh, will show what I do a little bit clearer. We've got some lettering, the CW, we've got an animal, the bear, and we've also got the state outline so once I've got this in, I will take and I will do the modifications required for my purposes. So here I have the layout finished. It's going to be a raised outline border on the state. I have the client's name, the size of the punch that is requested. We'll just scale this up here a little bit. So by using AutoCAD, I can take the size that the client is looking for and then all this circle is is the diameter of the steel uh, that I use and I use S7 steel for all of my punches I don't vary from that at all I was the head engraver for a company JE Enterprise uh, LLC we were privately commissioned to the mint on a lot of work and it's the only steel that we used we used it for all of our coining molds dies we used it for our uh, hot and cold hobs and this stuff's amazing and with the way I was taught to heat treat by both a German and an English uh, machinist tool and die maker they were masters at their trade this stuff's just amazing I love S7 for what it can take we had some coining dies that had three quarters of a million to a million strikes on it with nowhere tear damage to them at all the press that we had was a 500 ton hydraulic press that came out of Italy. We also had a 350 ton flywheel press and this stuff was just amazing at the beating it would take so this is why I use it for my touch marks, my maker's marks. So the next step is to take my S7 tool steel. I get this pre-cut in six inch lengths very convenient for me and it's a popular size, the most popular size for my clients. For the most part the ends are squared out pretty nice but I still need this set up very smooth and at 90 degree surfaces from the side to the top face. Simply just using my files, I square this up now at this time, I'm not looking for an absolute mirror surface yet. That would almost be detrimental at this point. But you've all seen steel being filed many, many times. You've done it yourself many, many times. So I'm not going to carry on too much further with this other than we just need to clean the steel up now. Okay, got my steel face cleaned up, square slightly mirror polish but not quite yet so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put layout transfer fluid on what this stuff is it's a 
liquid that I get from Sean Didyoung at uh, www.cowboyengraving.com. It is a liquid that when you put it on the surface of metal and it dries, it will take the transfer of the clear print that I did of the logo. Pretty simple. Rub it on. That's it. And I'm going to let this dry for approximately half an hour to one hour. It just seems on steel that this stuff works better once you've let it really dry. And from there, once it's dry, we're going to take one of these logos, lay it down, and we're going to transfer it over onto the surface of the steel. Initially, this is printed right side up. To make a transfer punch, it has to be in reverse, so when I lay it down, it actually goes on backwards. Few people have mentioned that when they see my punches that they're backwards. Well, they actually have to be in order to transfer positively onto your knife or whatever artwork that you're using. So we'll give this about half an hour and we'll get back to it. While we're waiting for the transfer fluid to dry, I'll go over the tools that I use to make these touch marks or maker's marks. I don't have a CNC machine. Uh, I like to say that my CN CNC machine in this shop stands for caffeine, nicotine, and coke, a cola. Uh, drink a lot of coffee, and yes, I smoke. <sighs> this is old school. These are made, you know, the way they would be would have been made, you know, decades, years ago, uh, before the advent of uh, CNC equipment. There are some things that I can do with these tools that a CNC machine cannot do. I'm not going to say anything bad about CNC's, they're wonderful, I've used them in machine shops etc before, but for what I'm doing here and what I'm offering to you the client, it's handmade, uh, you know it's like your knives, your blacksmithing work, your leather work, it's created by your hands. So I'm giving you a piece of artwork almost. Uh, in the form of a maker's mark or a touch mark. So to get into the equipment that I use, calipers, absolute necessity for this trade. I've got several files, jeweler's files that have been modified. I know it's hard to see here, this camera isn't exactly the best, but I grind the sides down to either allow me just to cut on the bottom or just on the side I'll clean the bottom up so that it's smooth or just on the face so I can take small micro slivers of metal off with these files. I also have my little die sinker chisels. I use these in conjunction with my die sinker hammer and I will literally go in and microscopically <laughs> times cut metal this way. I also have quite a large selection of stones. These give me varying degrees of finishes as I'm proceeding on the punches. I make cuts if there's little burrs or something. I always like to clean those up so that I always know that what I'm looking at uh, is true without any interference from a burr that's rolled over. The other thing that I have is a variety of actual hand gravers. So my gravers are very small. These are like cold chisels. Some of the, you're, I hope you're all familiar with what a cold chisel is. To put that into context, these chisels, some of the faces on these are, well this one in particular, let's go here. This cold chisel that right here is, well, let's try that again. Okay, so this cold chisel is nine thousandths of an inch wide. This one is slightly smaller yet. This one is actually stoned down to three thousandths of an inch wide. And here's one of my big hand gravers. This one is uh, one thirty seconds of an inch wide. I will use these and you will see it these being demonstrated in a little while here. This is what I use to carve the steel. Now another thing that I use is this is an engraver. Now this old girl She's been with me for over 25 years. It hooks up to a Fordham flex shaft. 
Um, there are engravers out there, engraving systems out there uh, that use air pneumatic. They're wonderful systems. They absolutely are. I'm not going to knock them. However, I've been using this for over 25 years. Uh, it was originally designed uh, for a tool and dime uh, application. Then it was modified, cleaned up, and made into an engraving system. This one's got tape on it. It's just a little more comfortable to hold in my hand is all when I'm using it uh, versus having my hands on the raw metal all the time. A little cushion there. It is relatively simple to use, so to speak. A quick chuck allows me to change my gravers. I make my own gravers. Any of the commercially available gravers, they just don't work for me. Uh, again, as I said, I was the head engraver for uh, that company that we were contracted to the Mint with. And some of the tool and die work, some of the mold work that we did we had an air assist graver there. It just wouldn't do the job that this would do. Um, the fine, ultra fine, precise control that we get with this, it's just unbeatable. The other thing is my engraving bench setup, people are quite surprised uh, when they find out what it costs to put this together. I might have in total $700 worth of equipment here with my power engraver, with my sharpening system, etc. Some of the pneumatic systems that are on the market along with the sharpening systems and the accessories that go with it, they're going to run you, you know, s thousands of dollars. And like I say, I'm not going to knock it, but this little girl and me, we've engraved uh, coin molds. Uh, commemorative military uh, dies. I was commissioned to do the Normandy and Dieppe and D-Day uh, commemorative military medals and this little grower was used on it. This is engraved motorcycle pieces, guns, knives, jewelry. The biggest thing that I've engraved with it, I engraved a per airplane propeller for a guy literally a case of more money than brains that was that was an insane project but anyhow so these are the tools that I use this is handmade what you're getting from me in your punch in your mark it's handmade so I just wanted to give you a brief outline of the tools that I use and I think that transfer fluid is just about dry so let's go grab it and set up the transfer and that'll be the next step. So our transfer fluid is dry. It's dried for just about an hour. So now what I'm going to do is take my print of the logo that I did on the clear uh, transfer film. I'm going to center it, lay it down on top of the punch, and just take a 3H hard pencil and burnish it and the ink from the transfer paper will go right on to the steel. This is a very, very precise way of laying out these maker's marks. Once you get the first bit started, it tends to stick down by itself. Some of the bigger punches I might use tape on the edge to hold it down, but anything that's half an inch and under, I can pretty much just hold it freehand and it's not going to move on me. This is incredible stuff. Sean did a very good job of developing this product. Uh, this might even have applications, you know, just for you knife makers for doing layouts, etc. Because it really does make precise locations and transferring very easy. Now, I'll see if I can get this into focus for you. Uh, there. Nope, wrong way. There we go. So as you can see, how nicely that transfer was over. So what's going to happen now is the black 
That's what I want raised. The rest of the metal, the shiny part, that's all going to be engraved away and carved away. When I get into the carving of the actual punch, uh, I'm going to talk about a few aspects of what I do and why I do it and why I think, I'll put it that way, my punches over a commercially made CNC uh, type punch is better. It has to do with transferring the blow of your hammer through the steel, through the face of the punch design and into your mark cleaner and crisper but we'll go into more detail on that in a little bit but right now we're about ready to engrave. Before we get into the engraving part here I'm going to go through a little bit of theory on how and why I make my punches. So what I've done here is a couple of little drawings on my AutoCAD program to try illustrate this. So if we go here, let's say our design is an anvil. We have a steel punch, uh, whatever diameter it needs to be. But when you look at the bottom up, all this red material is what would be removed away from the design to leave it raised. So it will make the transfer. Here I've shown it as to how a typical CNC uh, machine would do it. Fairly steep angles, um, anywhere from uh, 15 to 30 degrees. So the reason for that is those tools are designed to cut a long time and stay sharp and really not a lot of time put into the real fine uh, angle tools uh, from most commercial manufacturers of tooling and that's fine. So this would be removed, this would be removed, and that's what it would look like from the bottom up, which is going to leave you with a punch that looks similar to that if you were to do a cross section of it. Fairly wide, um, fairly sharp or deep angles, and a lot of times that's perfectly fine. What happens though is, we'll go to this one here, is when you strike the punch down into your steel or whatever material you're striking or stamping. What will happen is, is these forces indicated by these red lines here, they come down but any of this material on the side, the forces come in and at a 90 degree angle they shoot right towards the middle and they try to cancel each other out. So a lot of the energy that you use the blow of your hammer is actually cancelled out because it's got 90 degree edges on the outside. Now it still stamps down, of course it does, but you are wasting a lot of energy. If anybody wants to get into the theory of that, the machinist handbook, the bible of machining, there's chapters in there with all the mathematical formulas etc. We did use those formulas somewhat um, at that place uh, where I was engraving for. Uh, some of our cold hobs in particular, uh, we had to know pretty precisely what type of tonnage was required to strike the hob into the uh, receiving steel. Now another thing with these sharper angles is when it comes down into the steel, it pushes some of the steel down but it also displaces some of the steel and it creates a rounded edge. I've actually done a little piece of steel uh, showing this type of effect with a commercial angle on a punch. So once you're done stamping it and you clean your knife up, and I'll just run with that for right now, these humps have to be taken off. It has to be finished back down again. and. Sometimes it's not det detrimental, sometimes it is. But let's go over to this drawing here now. There we go. So we've got our little anvil, we've got our punch, this material needs to be removed away. So not only will I remove the material around the design itself, I also then, once I'm done engraving this, back engrave all of this material away. We'll go over here quickly. And what that allows is the stress or the forces of the hammer blow to come down and flow right into the absolute face of that punch where it's going into the steel. 
My punches are compression style punches. It actually does compress the steel down. Um, there's instructions uh, that come with these punches talking about that you know this does create a stress spot in the steel so does the other punch but mine tend to create a little bit more of a stress spot because I'm compressing metal with my punches and recommended actually very highly recommended you know heat treat your steel or your metal to take that stress out and then go ahead and carry on with your heat treating process from there if you're using it on non-ferrous materials silver gold copper not a big deal Back to here, these are the type of angles that I create on the sides of my design. I'm looking at anywhere from 4 to maybe 10 degrees. Um, I like that, again, back to here, that it forms a compression punch, goes straight down. And it keeps the design nice and tidy. When you start widening these out, well, the deeper that you go in, the wider this finish line is it matches what the angles of your punch are so if you've got an intricate design fairly lacy work etc you don't want it blown out of proportion by a big wide punch so that is the theory of why I make my punches the way that I do um, yeah I get rid of all of that material I go with shallower angles or a steeper angle depending on how you want to look at it the other thing that I can do on my designs and it's right here when you have a rotary tool cutting I'll just draw a little tiny circle here to make a little cutting tool as that tool is coming around and cutting these borders let's say that's spinning clockwise when it gets into corners it leaves a rounded corner it doesn't give you a square corner by hand engraving hand filing hand chiseling I can create those square corners and on a design uh, initials lettering uh, a design such as this it's you just it's impossible to do with a round tool so there you go there's a little bit of theory on why I make my punches the way that I do and I'm gonna show you a little piece of steel that I did some work on to actually demonstrate that now here I have taken and on a piece of S7 I have filed the surface so it's got slightly a rough finish on it still and I've made three punch marks this is with a cold chisel this is with a center punch and then this one is made with a dot punch that I use on doing backgrounds on guns, knives, etc. The cold chisel punch, I'll show you here, you can see it has that wide angle that I'm talking about. This was actually stoned to 25 degrees on either side, so 50 degrees inclusive center punch tool same perimeters 25 degrees on both sides oops I'm sorry this is 20 degrees both sides so it's 40 degree included angle and then my background punch you can see the difference quite drastically there that's stone to 5 degrees 10 degrees all inclusive so let's put these two together just as a comparison there we go so you can see that one has a very steep angle this one has a very shallow angle so let's see what happens as I said I've stoned these or I, I've uh, punched these so when I take my stone now and go over the surface we'll start over on this side here I can feel the raised material on these two on my dot punch there I can't feel it at all it's flushed down it's comp this is compressed so this is displaced so when we go and start finishing it and I'll just use the stones real quickly as I start taking the top off you can see the shiny area 
Well that's metal that's raised up and it has to be brought back down level with the surface here. So if you finished your piece, be it a knife or whatever, and let's say you've got it to a thousand grit finish and then you go ahead and put the touch mark on it, well that's going to raise up so that's got to be knocked back down and then you're back into you know over finishing perhaps go back to you know your 400 grit uh, 600 grits etc down to a thousand and so on so that can ruin a finish potentially I'll say potentially we keep going on it and it takes you know, I'm using a 400, actually this is a 120 grit stone. So it takes a little bit to get that knocked down. Once we go over to my punch dot there, I'm going to go with a 400 grit stone. And as soon as I start going across it, you can probably hear the difference. Let me tighten my device down. You can probably hear the difference and right away it's finished there's there's no raised edge there so that's why I like to use you know the the shallower angles or steeper angles again depending on how you want to look at this uh, and when I hand engrave my gravers are set up with these angles so I can retain and keep those angles in the metal so I think now it is time to actually go ahead and engrave this punch so you can see the rest of it, you know, what it takes to actually, you know, hands-on make this. Okay, we're ready to engrave here. So the vise that I use, it's a vise that I made. I used actually a Dremel vise, very inexpensive. I had a custom base made for it so that I can spin and swivel it. This is the only type of vise that allows me to hold these long pieces of steel. So I've got six inches that I got to hold down and I want the face that I'm going to be engraving on as close. Just tighten this up to this surface as I can so I can rest my hands. Uh, got leather on the jaws here. Uh, it helps hold the piece. Also it doesn't add any marring or marks to the side of it. This is my engraver. This is what I'm going to start off with. One thing I didn't mention in the one video there is I said this is hooked to a rotary shaft, but this doesn't rotate. This machine actually acts like a little miniature jackhammer. So as I step on the foot pedal, varying how fast I want it to go, it actually reciprocates back and forth microscopically, but it uh, duplicates the impact that you would get or could get if you were to use uh, let's see well <laughs> not good at this camera stuff the hammer and chisel part so what I'll do is I'll focus in in a minute here but I'm gonna start by engraving all around the outlines of the black so let's just bring this up and to focus a little bit closer yeah that should work So now I start hand engraving. So like I say, I'm just going to engrave all around the outlines of everything, see where I'm at, and determine what I need to do from there. So here we go. Okay, so there's the first line cut. Bring this over here. Um, grab my little chisel here. Little tiny burr of steel. There we go. Removed it off. And I'm just going to continue engraving like that until I've got all my perimeter done. So, back into the cut. And. So my right hand that I hold my engraver with pretty much stays stationary. I use my left hand to swivel the vise and turn the work into the cutting face.
as I said that black area from the transfer that's what's going to be left as the raised portion of this punch and that's what will actually transfer down into your knife or the piece of artwork that you're working on. Okay, so there we have the outside of the state engraved. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and I'll finish engraving all the rest of the lines here. Uh, this little video camera that I have, the clarity isn't that good, so what I'll do at this time is I'll just go ahead and engrave this and then I'll take a picture of it with my camera and show you what the first cut looks like. So I'll be about oh half an hour, three quarters an hour engraving all of this, get a picture of it and we'll carry on with this video. So here's the first uh, cut on the punch actually it's two cuts I make my first cut as you saw in the previous part of the video very light I go over everything once make sure that I'm happy with where my cut lines are and then uh, I go over it again to start deepening it out one of the things that I'm always looking for is you can see down at the left corner there by the W like those little rolls divots that's part of the state of Georgia so you want to make sure that it matches what the client set for artwork and exactly what uh, that individual is looking for so I'm pretty happy with this um, I'm gonna take now and I'll start clearing out all of the background so that would all that's the material you know in and around the bear the C the W the knife I like to remove my backgrounds at least 25 thousandths of an inch if I can uh, ultimately if I can I try get down to 40 thousandths of an inch deep and that's sufficient for these type of stamps um, you go over how wide custom knives are or knives are and I've worked on quite a few of them and you know you put that down into into the metal that's that's a lot of that's a lot of depth going in there it gives you a little wiggle room as well so so the next step now is to take back to the engraver should be able to video this um, with a flat chisel probably go in starting out with a 30 thousandths wide flat chisel and just start cleaning out all the background now along the edge on the outer edge I'll just use my bench grinder to knock off the bulk of that extra material and then I'll come in with my Fordham with my little burrs and stones and clean right up to that line that I've cut and that will be the end of that on the outside so back to the video of us, me actually engraving and let's see how this goes. So this video making process is a little tougher, a little more difficult than what I thought. I'm not used to this stuff. I um, said I was going to show how I cleaned out the background. Well, I was videotaping that or, and with my hands going over top of it, trying to keep it in focus. Uh, our two cats jumping into the scene to help out it really didn't work out th that pretty good so I guess if I'm gonna do these videos or do you know other videos in the future I might have to not be so Scottish and invest in a decent camera and get set up for this suffice to say though at this stage I've cleared out most of the background um, the graver that I used for this it's a flat chisel 30 thousandths of an inch wide and you know if you can see it to me this is a big chisel so what I've done now or what I've got now is the backgrounds pretty much cleared away there's a couple of little areas that I don't go in with the power assist they're a little fine I don't want to take a chance of slipping so I'll come in with my hand gravers now and my files 
that I've modified for this and do some of the final scraping and cutting that way. See if I can just bring this up. Yeah, one more. Does that work? Okay. There you go. I think you can see that. Yeah, my lighting, it's good for engraving, but maybe not so good for this. But you can see background. It's removed now to 22 thousandths of an inch, so I'm happy with that. I'll actually, I'm going to stipple the background on this. I think that'll add a nice contrast and texture to it when it's used. So I'm going to back away again. And, oops, I'll go up a little bit. I think that worked. There we go. So there's an area over here in the top corner of the state. I've got a couple of little burrs and sections in there that I'm not happy with. See what I mean? What works for me, engraving doesn't work so good for videotaping. There we go. So anyhow, same process with the power engraver. I just come in and cut these areas. And I really want to make sure there we go. My corners in the state are nice and squared up. Obviously this isn't a 90 degree corner, it's a little less, so there we go, that was nice. So these slivers of metal, I wish I could capture these. Yeah, you can't even see them. But I mean they're literally slivers. Um, and trust me, I have gotten them into my fingers before they hurt. Part of the game. So right up into that corner, like I say, I want that squared. I don't want it rounded or anything like that. That's not how the design is. It's not what I'm going to give my client is something that isn't right. Yeah. yeah, you can kind of see little shiny spots on my finger. So those are pieces of the background that I'm taking out. So once I'm done, one more piece right there. There we go. Once I'm done with that, now to even out the bottom, if I was to leave this as a very smooth bottom, I'm just using my, I call these die sinker files, but I mean the little jeweler files that I've modified, all we would do is go in and just file that surface and even it right out. Oh, I've got one more little burr right there. There we go. So these kind of act as a combination graver file. Now these have been, this is a big one, but into really fine areas I've got quite a selection of these files that I've made. The one file I got it cut right down to about three thousandths, two thousandths of an inch. It still has enough tooth. The files are from Germany. Um, but it still has enough teeth on the bottom that I can come in between really fine areas and touch those up. Actually, this punch might look good just with a smooth background. I'll see. Um, one of the other things that I do, there we go, that looks good. That's cleaning up nice, is as I'm going along to check this, to see how my print is going. I just use plasticine. I flatten it out and I'll just take and push it on top and 
that gives me an idea of what I've got going on. Let's turn this around. And see how crisp and clean my punch is coming out. And it shows me right away if I've got any areas that aren't quite right. So right now, by looking at this, I can tell the one area over in this corner right here. I need a little bit of metal removal in there. And it's so it's back and forth from gray for a while file put my plasticine down have a look at it see how it's looking yeah, okay need to touch up there that looks good and just keep carrying on so that's a old tool and die makers trick mold makers trick right there plasticine to see how that's going and see a couple more little areas down in here So I'm hoping, no, there we go. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll stop here. And I think this is showing enough, you know, between the engraving on the first part when I did the outlines and to what I'm doing here. I said I was going to show you these tools that I use. I think I've covered that but what I'll do now is I'll go over to my bench grinder with this I'll just knock off roughly all of this outside material and then I'll show you the Fordham being used and the burrs to clean up that edge and also you know, let's lift this up how that winds up tapering this punch out so I'll stop it here and I'll be back in a minute or two here with the ground down punch and we'll start getting this thing finished off and getting it ready for heat treating. So here I've taken the punch over to my bench grinder and I've removed all the material along the side, that background. So this is rough right now, like any machining process. You've got your rough cut, medium cut, and then fine, final cut. So this would be my rough cut. Let's see if we can bring this up here. There we go. So that, yeah, we'll get it focused in here. I'm going to use this little vise now to do the rest of this. I want absolutely no movement or vibration. As I'm cutting along here with my Fordham, um, you screw up now, cut over the edge and into the design, all of that works for nothing, and I have done that before. So here's Fordham. This is now a rotary hand piece, and again, I've got my tape on it, make it a little more comfortable to hold. So this is the first burr that I'm going to use, kind of a rounded cone-shaped burr, and I'll just go and I'll start blending these edges up and for this I wear gloves because this slivers that come off of this now are nasty miserable little things and they do stick in and infect quite nicely so I'm just gonna get a couple of things ready here and we'll start here right away so that last section of video wasn't focused all that well but I think it showed clear enough what I had done on the bench grinder so now we'll go with the Fordham and we'll start cleaning up this outside edge a bit so here we go So what I'm doing now is I'm just cutting all this material away, blending in along the edge here down into the length of the shaft, and I'm cutting right up to the, the 
bottom of my outline cut into the middle of it. Um, I don't know how to put it any other way than that. And then once I get there, once I've this little micro thin edge of steel is flipped off, I know that I'm where I want to be and then I'll switch my burr over to a finer burr and then I will very very carefully shave right up to that line so keep cutting away with this big one for a while okay this takes a while, um, so I'm not going to bore you with just watching me carve away on the outside of this. So once I've got all the rough cut or next, or the, the rough cut done here, then I'll come back in with a fine burr and I'll show you that. So we're back to the camera again. I tried videotaping more of the grinding process with that bigger burr, and it just wasn't working. So here you can see along the edge of the state outline a little bit of a ledge or a lip there. It, it's, you know, two thousandths, five thousandths of an inch, ten thousandths of an inch in areas. That's my rough grind. So now what I'll do is I'll switch over to a finer burr, smaller burr, and I'll come up to the edge very tight and close with that. And that'll be the next picture. I'll show you that. Um, sorry, I just can't focus the little video camera that I have this little webcam uh, to get good detail so I'll stop on this one and insert the next picture and show you what I've done next so here's the punch now after I used my fine burr that lip edge that was along the edge of the state outline is now pretty much gone a couple of small little areas that are left but I'll catch those after heat treating this edge is very fine right now I don't want to take a chance on damaging it so I'll wait till the steel is hard a little bit of cleanup in the inside yet I see a couple of small areas there I want to touch up a bit but this punch is pretty much ready for heat treating now so I'll show you a picture of the plasticine stamp that I took and we'll go from there So here's the plasticine strike that I took. Uh, it's a little hard to see in the picture, but for me, when I look at it, it shows me everything that I need to see. Um, my edges are clean. Bottom surface, that's all cleaned up now. And the bare and all of that, the detail shows. Like I said, it's a little hard to see right here, but I know what I'm looking at and I know what I've got. So, like I said this is ready for heat treating and I'll in the next section of this video I'll go into that so this punch is pretty much done at this stage of the game until the heat treating's done alright we're pretty much at the end of the engraving carving portion of this punch what will happen now is I'll heat treat it um, there's a special way that I heat treat. It's the way we did it at the Mint, or that place that I worked at. I don't know if it's proprietary information on that, so I'm not going to get into that. Uh, we did treat Heat RS7 different than what the book says to do it. Um, it uh, yeah, it's quite an involved process from here. Uh, once the punch is heat treated, it is followed by a triple tempering process. Like I say, I don't want to get in trouble with Bureau of Engraving or anybody like that, so I'm not going to get into that. When I'm done the heat treating, I'll come back in. I had little minor areas on the edge of the border here that I needed to clean up. I'll use diamond stones on that, do the final polish. At that time, I am going to stipple the inside of this. I've got a carbide bit that I that I made that will put a nice textured finish on the hardened steel so just using my hand tools this is 
how I make the punches. This state border, I measured it real quickly, it's eight thousandths of an inch thick. So it's fine, it's delicate, it's lacy. Now will it stand up to the rigors of using it as a touch mark? Absolutely. Um, that's what this steel is designed for. What else can I say about this? Um, you know, like I said, I'm not knocking CNC equipment, not at all. It's people were asking, how do I make them? Well, this is how I make them. These are, this is handmade. So, you know, little hand gravers, my die sinker files, stones, and steady hands. This is how I make these marks. If you go to my webpage, uh, their website, um, there's examples of the different marks that I've made on there. Uh, I keep adding to it as I go along. Give you an idea as to what I can do, put it that way. And as I was going through this video, I mentioned some company names and some individuals. What I'll do is at the end here, if you're interested in any of that stuff, I'll do a little, I guess, slideshow listing the names of the companies that I use, where I get my equipment from, etc., etc. If if you want to pursue it. Um, as far as the engraving equipment goes, the power assist, I've gotten into the debate before over air, over this engraver that I use. Uh, not going to get into that again. I stand by what I can do with the equipment that I have. I am not a believer that you have to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars to get into this game. Not at all. And I'll leave it at that. Um, I don't teach. This video was an overview as to how I do this. It wasn't meant to be an instructional teaching video. Maybe sometime down the road I'll get into that. You know, I'll get a better camera, etc. so that everything that I do will be super crisp. This was just meant to show you how I do it. Video is a little bit long, I understand that, but this isn't really something that you can show in 10 minutes or, or less. It doesn't work that way. There's there's a lot of skill, a lot of, you know, uh, what do I want to say here? There's a lot goes into these. Um, as I said, you, my client, you're getting a handmade custom mark just for you. It's, you know, it, I put a lot of heart and soul into this stuff. Yeah, it's artwork. Anyhow, I think I'll wrap up here. I hope that gives you, you know, a bit better understanding of what goes into your stamp. Um, and Thank you for the interest in wanting to see what I do. And again, I hope you know this was informative, educational. Um, like I said, not a complete 100% step-by-step process of how to do this. More, more of an overview and like of that. So I've got a ton more of these to make. So I better wrap it up here and get carving on some steel want to heat treat about 10 of these by the end of the week if possible so anyhow thank you very much and again uh, if you have any questions or anything like that the links there how to get a hold of us and we're more than happy to answer questions there's really not too many secrets in this shop so thanks again and take care be well bye bye